Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the trustees of the National Gallery of Art, I'd like to welcome you here to today's program, the 19th annual lecture, the Sidney J. Friedberg Lecture on Italian Art. My name is Faya Kazi, and I'm the head of the Academic Programs Department in the Division of Education. The Sidney J. Friedberg Lecture on Italian Art features distinguished scholars presenting original research. This annual lecture series began in 1997 and is named after the great specialist of Italian art, Sidney J. Friedberg, who taught at Harvard University for 29 years until his appointment here in 1983 as chief curator at the National Gallery of Art. We'd like to thank very much the Friedberg family for their continued support of this annual event. And, and in the audience today, there are several family members, and I hope they don't mind, and ask please to recognize Catherine Friedberg and Sidney J. Friedberg, Jr. The 19th Friedberg Lecturer is David Beinman, Emeritus Durning Lawrence Professor of the History of Art at University College London, and also visiting professor in the History of Art, Harvard University, and Image of the Black Archive and Library Fellow also at Harvard. <laughs> professor Weinman was educated both in Britain and the United States, and his lifetime of appointments, fellowships, and honors are also cross-Atlantic. He was educated at Oxford University, Harvard University, and at the Courtauld Institute, where he received his PhD. Among his many fellowships, there have been three here at the National Gallery at our Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, first in 1990 and most recently in 2003. His association with the National Gallery goes, goes beyond that, for he has served several years as a jury member for our museum fellowships and internships. And he's no stranger to this podium or if we have a panel um, because he has lectured here and he has been on the panel for the three launches we've done here for the Image of the Black in Western Art series. As some of you may know, the 10-volume series was co-edited with Henry Louis Gates, Jr., all, and all of these volumes were published between 2010 and 2015. Two new volumes, The Image of the Black and African and Asian Art, will appear in 2016. Professor Beinman is a distinguished art historian who has an unusual depth of knowledge and publications. Not only is he known for his great connoisseurship of art, but he's esteemed for his innovative work on art and its social history, and for his long-standing interest in the history of aesthetics, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries. Professor Beinman has curated or collaborated on museum uh, exhibitions and catalogs, as well as being the author of numerous scholarly publications throughout his career. In this way, he is the model of a modern art historian that is working between the museum and the academy, and also speaking to different audiences, not only to his peers, but also with his great interest in the general public. For many, and that is how I first knew him, David Beinman is known as a specialist on certain 18th century British artists, William Blake, Hogarth, John Flaxman. Then we got to know that he was really interested in sculpture too with his um, co-authored book on Rubiliac. And now we find him not only working on um, the editing of the series of the Image of the Black and Western Art, but Torwald's in and Canova. But it's this general um, expanse he is a much honored professor and has many, many students. And his books reflect some of this. For example, one, um, one of his first books was on the history of sculpture. That was 1970. But he's also another big undertaking, the Thames and Hudson Encyclopedia of British Art, for which he was the editor and main contributor. I would like to say also one note about David and how he's known. When I was um, in California, a William Blake had a number of fans, collectors, and a professor at my alma mater, um, UC Santa Barbara, 
So the very first time that I heard David speak, it was with a whole group of groupies of William Blake. <laughs> Next thing he turns up and he is um, writing and speaking about Hogarth and really giving us a profound understanding of the beginning, perhaps, of um, English 18th century painting. And then we find out, on the side, he's really been thinking hard about sculpture. And his work on Flaxman, um, just to name one, or Robiliac, um, his book on Robiliac, for example, won the Mitchell Prize for the best book in art history in 1996. And so this um, interest, um, and in the background is always the question of aesthetics. I want to say something about his most recent book, um, and that is called Warm Flesh, Cold Marble, Canova, Torwaldson, and Their Critics, which is of 2015. That's this year. And it's this book that came to our attention in regards to the Friedberg Lectures, for it centers on a major 19th century um, Italian artist, but it also brings together issues of concern to Professor Beinman throughout his career, and that's what we hope to do with this series, is to bring distinguished um, uh, scholars who are looking broadly at Italian art. Today's lecture comes out of what I think is a brilliant book, and which focuses on the aesthetic concerns of the two most important sculptors of the 19th century, um, Antonio Canova and his illustrious Danish rival. What we will hear today are the bringing together of um, many of David's interests um, and showing how artists worked in dialogue, with, um, influenced by philosophical and critical debates, um, and those affected their sculptures. I'd like very much now to bring to the podium Professor David Beinman. Well, thank you very much, Fire, and it's extremely nice to be back at the National Gallery. I have very happy memories of my times, uh, three times at CASVA. Um, now, it's also a particular honor to be giving a lecture in memory of Sidney Friedberg. So I knew him when I was a student in his department at Harvard in the early 1960s. He was then a grand and inspiring figure as chairman of the department, for he had recently published painting of the High Renaissance in Rome and Florence, and was widely seen as the true heir to the great Bernard Berenson. I did not study with him. My interests then and now are in more recent periods and in northern countries rather than in Italy. So I'm something of an interloper in the present role. However, Canova, though Italian, was one of those great figures whose fame spanned the whole of Europe and reached the United States in his own lifetime. Furthermore, his career and output raised fundamental questions about art and our response to it. The topic I'll be talking about this afternoon derives from the work that I did on my book, Warm Flesh, Cold Marble, Canova Torvaldsen and Their Critics. And I should say that I had a complaint from a friend who pointed out that it was very much more about cold marble than warm flesh in the book, um, and accused me of trying to entice readers under false pretenses. <laughs> And I regret to say that my lecture might be open to the same complaint. So if I see a rush for the door, I won't be surprised. Uh, the one thing we all know about Canova's sculptures, and this, there is a, a kind of paradox in the title, um, is that they're not colored. They're made of and, of and defined by pure white marble. They are the essence of what the late Robert Rosenblum called the erotic frigidaire insofar as they express a sense of living flesh, it is paradoxically in a cold, even chilly marble, uh, medium rather. Yet at the height of his fame, from the beginning of the 19th century onwards, Canova was celebrated in some quarters and notorious in others for his attempts to mitigate their coldness by adding various substances uh, to the surface of his sculptures and occasionally even attaching metal accessories, including, for instance, the figure of victory, which I show on the screen, um, which is uh, in, the, uh, in, in this gallery, 
um, and it's a model for uh, an object held by Napoleon in the great marble statue in Apsley House in London. And it's not always realized that Canova in his mature years almost always tinted or added a coating to contrast flesh with drapery, and in some cases he even added flesh coloring. But in every case, except for just one possible example in the Victorian Albert Museum, all traces of such additions have been scrubbed off, either deliberately on the grounds that it masked the purity of the original marble, or by the conscientious work of generations of palace and country house chambermaids. Uh, and the one uh, exception is the example I show here, um, which doesn't come out very clearly in the image, but there does seem to be uh, a, a different uh, tonality between the, the hair and, and the flesh in it, which uh, seems to have survived the, the centuries. Most people who had opinions on sculpture in Canova's time, that's to say artists, art theorists, and critics, hated the idea of colouring the surface of marble, though many of his patrons, like the Bonapartes and the Countess Albrizzi, were quite happy with it. Canova's detractors, of which there were surprisingly many at the time, thought it brought the illusion and deception inherent into painting into the spiritually elevated an ancient art of sculpture, appealing to those lesser beings who possessed disappointingly mundane perceptions. Surface color was associated especially with a sculptor who was believed in the early 19th century to have been responsible for everything that was wrong in the state of modern sculpture. And you may be surprised to know that's actually Gian Lorenzo Benini. Um, and you might ask, uh, and it's a very fair question, what was wrong with Bernini? Um, today we recognize him as a sculptor of towering genius and astonishing virtuosity. What museum does not treasure their Berninis as much as anything in their collections? Besides, Bernini did not tint or color his sculpture, even though he did on a very few occasions employ colored marbles. Bernini's crime in the eyes of the classically minded Cognoscenti of the late 18th century was what we admire most in his work, the way he overcame the limitations of marble to bring it to life, giving it a sense of palpitating flesh. In his Apollo and Daphne, which I show, uh, for instance, the god and his victim seem to move like the wind, and the sense of life is so palpable that one forgets that it is carved meticulously from unyielding blocks of marble. We marvel also at the way that each of the wind-blown twists of marble uh, creates a, a dazzling sense of lightness and nature while cunningly helping the structure to remain stable. But such extraordinary virtuosity was precisely the problem for the late 18th century. Eye-deceiving realism went completely against the belief that the ancients had made marble the carrier of sublime and spiritual thought by remaining true to its essential and unyielding nature. Bernini was by contrast a conjurer, a trickster, who made the ignorant public gasp at the way he had provided an illusion of reality. Canova himself put it succinctly in comparing the Venus de Medici with Bernini's Saint Teresa, concluding that the Venus had, and I quote, a rare nature a grace, an idea, and is a piece of heaven compared to a work completely capricious and false. If the sculptures of antiquity were exemplary in their solemn solemnity and elevation, occupying the highest reaches of philosophical insight, then Bernini's theatrical imitations of the passing effects of the material world were an abasement of a noble heritage. I hasten to say I don't believe a word of any of this, but uh, myself. Um, Canova um, had seemed at the beginning of his career to fully understand what was needed uh, or understood to be the uh, com uncompromising heritage of antiquity. His early reputation was based mainly on two sculptures, 
the uh, one I show on the screen, Theseus and the Minotaur, in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the monument to Clement XIV in Santissimi Apostoli in Rome. They are textbook examples of the new neoclassicism, which emphasize stillness um, and a stern high-mindedness. The Theseus represents the triumph of the contemplative mind over the material body, represented by the dead Minotaur at his feet. The hero is shown not in battle, but in reflection upon it, and his torso has the reductive simplicity of early Greek sculpture. The Clement XIV monument, though based on a Benini-like iconography and configuration, has none of the latter's sense of drama, leaving three isolated and con contemplative figures organized within a starkly rational composition that makes the door that it incorporates into a, a death-like void. Such works brought Canova instant acclaim across Europe as a reformer who had literally revived sculpture and brought it back to a high, the high seriousness of ancient Athens. He attracted the patronage of the powerful from the Pope and the Bonaparte family to royalty and aristocracy across Europe. But what he did after those two works represented a complete change of direction he created a series of figures, both male and female, that seemed to repudiate the high-mindedness of those two works. The Perseus, which I show on the screen, which occupied the sacred plinth in the Cortile Belvedere in the Vatican that had held the Apollo Belvedere, recently stolen by Napoleon, in its elegant triumphalism and its relief-like configuration, belonged more to the theorist Winkelmann's beautiful style than the sculptor's more rugged Theseus. His great group of Cupid and Psyche, reclining, a favorite of the Bonaparte family, is perhaps the most erotic of all neoclassical sculptures. Chief among the critics was the young German Karl Ludwig Fernhoff, a member of Goethe's circle, who is a radical follower of the great philosopher Kant and eventually of the French Revolution, saw at first in Canova's work a true understanding of the lessons of antiquity and resolved to write the sculptor's biography. But his enchantment with Canova did not last long, and by the time his book actually appeared in 1806, it became a scathing account of the sculptor's betrayal of his youthful promise. For Fernoff, Canova's work of the 1790s especially the Hebe of 1795 to 96, made in two versions, one for the Countess Albrizzi, and now in Berlin, and the other for Josephine Bonaparte, and now in the Hermitage, was a catastrophic denial of classical principles. Even so, Fernoff was reluctant to bring up a comparison with Bernini, because that would have seemed so excessive a condemnation as to cast doubt on his sanity. However, despite Canova's sensitivity to any suggestion that he was anyway beholden to Bernini, a comparison between the Hebe and Bernini's Apollo and Daphne is, in my view, not at all far-fetched. Needless to say, Fernoff was most critical of what he calls the formless white cloud um, on which Hebe makes a dramatic entrance to offer wine to the gods. This cloud presents a brilliant paradox. On the one hand, it gives an incomparable effect of lightness, as if the handmaid is literally floating on a cloud. Yet it also presides, provides a solid marble support for the figure. Fernoff, however, compared it uh, uh, to the clouds in tasteless trinity columns um, by which he meant such things as, I think, the, the pest soiler in Vienna's Graben, um, though even then he did not mention the dreaded name of Bernini. Um, but from whom else would Canova have learnt the extraordinary forward movement of the, the figure that so convincingly transformed the weight of the marble into airy lightness? The patrons of both versions, 
were evidently delighted by the sculpture, but Canova's chief supporters, the French critic Catramer de Cancy and the Count Chiconara, were both sensitive to informed opinion and seemed to have persuaded Canova in a later version to get rid of the cloud, uh, and that's true of the two subsequent versions, replacing it with a traditional tree trunk as an alternative structural support. So no cloud, um, just a tree trunk. Um, furthermore, objections were made to the gilded uh, metal jug and cup uh, up there. The what are known as dorures um, held by Hebe, which one of Canova's defenders argued would have been impossible to reproduce in marble. Um, his rival sculptor, the young Dane, Bertel Torvaldsen, um, no doubt in response to the controversy and seeing an opportunity, um, gave a convincing answer by doing just that in his own version of Hebe. And as you can see, the, the marble cup and marble jug. Um, the buzz of criticism of the supposed effeminacy of the Hebe and his even more famous group of the Cupid and Psyche, which we saw, forced Canova into defensive action that involved making a number of exaggeratedly male figures, uh, like the Hercules and Lycus of 1802, that only further enraged the by now irreconcilable Thurnoff. When one talks of color in Canova's work, there are three aspects that are both separate and interconnected. There is the color and texture of marble itself, which can vary according to its origin and the way it was, is worked by the sculptor. There is what is attached to it, that's to say the dorure, which can be accessories to the figure or adornments to it. And then there is the question of the coating of the marble, which can vary from a manual toning down of the surface and tinting to full-blown highlighting with flesh color. It needs affirming that marble is never simply white in color. The surface of a marble sculpture has texture and luminescence, and that can vary according to the natural properties of the marble used and the way it's acted on by the sculptor. Canova was famous for his care with the final surface of his sculptures, which he insisted on carrying out himself. Nicholas Penny has noted the extraordinary variety of the working of the surface of the Louvre, Cupid and Psyche, as you can see in this detail, in which several tools have been used to differentiate skin from hair and from inanimate objects. Catramer de Cancy, in his lengthy account of the statue of Paris, describes the work as not carved or polished, but caressed and kissed into life by the sculptor. Different types of marble were used for sculpture, largely depending on where the work was made. There are broad differences between Greek and Italian marble, but also differences within each type according to region and location. The great 18th century theorist of the antique Winkelmann noted that Greek Parian marble was softer, while Car Carrara marble, that's to say that used by Canova and Torvaldsen, was more dazzlingly white and luminescent, though in practice it's not always easy to tell the difference, um, particularly uh, if the object has lost its original surface. I show here, for example, a bust of Antonia, uh, niece of Mark Antony, uh, in the Harvard Art Museum, um, which is described in the, the museum catalogue that the head is made of in Parian marble, while the nef left shoulder is restored in Carrara marble, uh, the rest of the torso being Parian, though from another classical bust. You can, with close looking, detect a certain difference between the different marbles, but it's not great in this case. And the, this basically is uh, Carrara marble and the rest is Parian, but it's not at all uh, obvious, I think, to the naked eye. Furthermore, marble from one country or region 
is not necessarily uniform in its qualities. An example of a different types of Parian marble being used for deliberate effect is the famous, or perhaps we should say notorious, Getty Aphrodite from Morgantina, which has recently been returned to Italy. The face and the surviving arm um, are uh, clearly in a different type of marble from the clothed part of the body. But the Parian or Pentelic marble from which the whole statue is made is visibly different um, uh, from the Carrara marble used by Canova. Winkelmann argued that um, Parian marble is closer to flesh than the Carrara marble used by Italian sculptors, which by contrast is more suited to expressing light and translucency, what Fabio Barry, a recent fellow at CASVA, has called a condition of embodied radiance with supernatural reference. But there were different grades of both Parian and Carrara marbles, so the Morgantina sculpture's face was made in a finer or more luminescent kind of Parian marble than that used for the drapery, perhaps to emphasize the subject's godliness. Though there is now an, an enormous amount of evidence that many, perhaps more than most Greek and Roman sculptures were highly colored, either in their materials or their surface, or had metal additions, sculptors were evidently just as conscious of the properties of different types of marble. The recent experiments in Germany that have reconstructed ancient statues by presenting them painted in strong, might even say fairground colors, um, have in my view distracted attention from the sensitivity of sculptors, both ancient and modern, to different kinds of marble and its effects. Nor should we assume that all elements of ancient statues were always painted. As Fabio Barry has convincingly demonstrated, whiteness in marble was associated with light and also with godliness, something that survives through the Christian tradition. Hence it is clear that depicting the face and other parts of the body in unmediated white marble or even ivory might have been one way of representing gods or godlike emperors, differentiating them from mortals or their bodies from the clothes they might be wearing. However, the belief that antique sculpture was by its nature pure white was deeply ingrained from the Renaissance onwards and was taken for granted by the sculptors of Canova's generation. So we can now begin to see his problem. The marble that he was obliged to use from Carrara had properties that were agreed to be furthest away from flesh tones. So if Canova wanted to emulate the effect of living flesh, he would uh, have to transform the surface artificially, which would be anathema to the predominant beliefs of what ancient sculpture was supposed to have originally looked like. But then Canova's relationship with his lifelong friend, Catramere de Cassi, who wrote a lengthy biography of him after his death, gave him an almost unique insight into the question of the color of antique sculpture. Catramer was one of those characters like Lafayette and Talleyrand who managed to ride the extraordinary and dangerous changes that beset the French state over the period from the 1789 French Revolution through Napoleon and the Restoration into the age of Louis Philippe in the 1830s. Catramer overcame his central role in the revolution. He was largely responsible for the deconsecration of the Church of Saint Genevieve and its transformation into the Pantheon, um, with barely a stain on his reputation, unlike so many others who suffered death or exile for their participation in the revolution. Something of this self-preserving flexibility comes out in his relationship with Canova, for his theoretical works would seem to suggest that he would have been more comfortable among the sculptor's detractors. Catramer was in fact the most notable pioneer of the theory, now universally taken for granted, that the ancient Greeks habitually employed color in their sculptures. 
despite the monochrome appearance of almost all that has survived. He revived an awareness amply documented by the Greek traveler Pausanias in the second century AD that the most prominent Greek devotional works of earlier centuries were of an unimaginable splendor from the variety of polychrome materials in which they were made, including ivory, gold, and other metals. Catramere first announced that the cult statues of Jupiter uh, Olympus um, and also uh, of Athena Parthenos in the most prominent temples of ancient Greece were made up of chrysan elephantine materials rather than marble or bronze. In his sumptuous volume of 1814 called Le Jupiter Olympien, which I sh show on the screen, I have a plate from it, um, he argued that polychromy in Greek sculpture encompassed not only the use of colored materials like ivory and gold in the construction of cult statues, but also the practice of tinting marble sculpture. Though as Alex Potts points out, he believed the colors to be used schematically rather than naturalistically. If Catramere's purely, purely theoretical work, Sur l'Ideal, of 1805 had offered the artist a stern vision of his duty to consult his inner being before all things of the world, Le Jupiter Olympien conjures up a romantic dream of a lost and gorgeous world of antiquity to be reclaimed in the imagination. He quotes Pausanias's description of the Olympian Jupiter. The god made of gold and ivory is seated on a throne on his head is a crown in the form of a laurel branch. In the left hand of the god is a brilliant scepter made of all kinds of metal. The god has a shoe of gold. His cloak is of, a, of gold also. Catramere's vision of antiquity thus has two aspects, the use of materials beyond the limitations of marble and the use of color as an essential element, not only of Greek sculpture in general, uh, but of Greek sculpture at its very highest level, that of the cult figures of Jupiter on Mount Olympus and Athena in the Parthenon. This put varied materials and color both literally and figuratively in the inner sanctum of Greek art and religion. And they are compared by the author with a way that the gorgeous colors of medieval fresco paintings conveyed the truth of religion to the ignorant. However, long before the publication of the book, Canova had achieved notoriety in France for coloring or at least tinting his sculpture. When Josephine's uh, Bonaparte's version of Hebe went on public display with other Canova sculptures in the Paris Salon of 1808, the newspaper Le Mercure Francais praised the way that the flesh was highly polished while the clothing retained its natural brown color set against the gold of Hebe's jug and cup. This provoked a lengthy reply in the Journal de l'Empire of the 3rd and 4th of January, 1809, which took Canova to task for seeking to imitate the real color of the body, a process it claimed was a return to the horrors, the horrors of the siècle de barbarie, the centuries of bar bar barbarism, by which was meant evidently the polychromy of late medieval sculpture. The author emphasized and surely exaggerates the variety of color in Canova's sculpture, even invoking Titian. He mentions a gilded hairband and the jug and cup held by Hebe describing the visible flesh of the sculpture as impregnated with a preparation of sulfur and wax, which give to the body a semi-diaphanous translucency like certain kinds of alabaster. This is meant to be a very offensive remark, anyway. Um, the account also mentions that some parts of the face were lightly rouged, while the draperies kept the natural whiteness of the marble. The author goes on to reproach Canova for, say, petit artifice, and though admiring of the discretion with which they were employed, pleads with other sculptors to avoid such false innovations as a betrayal of the achievement of, of the great ages of sculpture. <clears throat> 
Misserini, who is um, Canova's secretary, would have been in daily contact with the sculptor at the time, remarks that Canova had noticed a preparation on the surface of some antique works that had given a greater harmony to their lineaments, tempering their harshness and sweetening the contours of the form, noting that Pliny cited Praxiteles as having been admired for using such a method. Misserini also gave another reason for applying a surface to the marble. It can be used, as he puts it, to anticipate the effects of time. In other words, to act as a kind of patination to give a certain mellowness to the surface, just as bronze was always coated to tone down the surface. To achieve this, I quote, Canova found a liniment with which to moderate and sweeten the marble, but that was not enough, and so he began to wash his sculpture with aqua di rota, which is apparently water used for soaking metal tools, which had a smoothing effect. However, Misserini describes as a lying assertion that Canova used lead oxide, which is ombra di minio, to highlight Hebe's lips, despite the critic of the Journal de L'Empire specifically mention their redness and that of her cheeks. You do sometimes get the sense that people are not looking at the same sculpture that they're describing. It is not knowing exactly when Canova began to apply a liquid surface to his sculpture, but it's likely that he was influenced in this by Catramere's discovery of ancient coloring, which the author claims was first noticed by him more than 30 years before the publication of Le Jupiter Olympien in 1814. So that is to say before 1784. And we can be sure that he would have discussed this theory with Canova before the appearance of the volume. In any case, the version of Hebe owned by Josephine Bonaparte was only completed in 1805. In Catramare's biography of Canova, he admits that the sculptor put on his marbles a special preparation of color applied like painting, but that he only used a wax process that preserved the marble from damage from the air or humidity. And this process is so commonly, commonly used that it is not worth remarking on. The last of the four versions of the Hebe in Forli of 1816 to 17, which I show on the screen, executed for the Countess, uh, Contessa Veronica Guarini, uh, differs from the earlier versions in having, in addition, an elaborate gilt metal necklace and hairband. And you can see the, the necklace and the hairband. Catramere notes in his account of the Hebe in his biography of Canova that he had written a book in which he had argued that some of the most notable Greek sculptures had been constructed from a mixture of different elements that might well have included gilded metals to heighten their splendor. The addition of these metal ornaments in, is made even more striking um, by the move by both Canova and Torvaldsen in this decade towards a more severe style. It is therefore likely that Catramere was behind Canova's decision to provide a more fully ornamental, more ornamented and perhaps colored version of the Hebe, and that this latter would have seen such ornamentation not as superficial decoration, but as giving an antique authenticity to the work. The Forli Hebe was probably, as, it was, as was the second version for Josephine Bonaparte, now in the Hermitage, lightly tinted by Canova, though no trace of it remains on either sculpture today. The Duke of Bedford, who had commissioned uh, one of the, the two groups of the Three Graces for Woburn Abbey from Canova, noted in a letter to the sculptor of May the 4th, 1817, that he had seen the Hebe and Terpsichore on display at the Royal Academy, 
and that he was, quote, now fully convinced by ocular demonstration that there is no artificial uh, preparation used to give color to the marble, and the only thing I do not quite like is a slight tint of vermilion in the cheeks and lips of the Hebe, which, however, as you justly observe, may easily be taken off by a wet sponge. In the case of the Woburn Three Graces, the Duke of Bedford insisted in a letter to Canova of March the 3rd, 1817, that it was cleaned down to the bare marble before he would take delivery of it. We have the idea in this country uh, that you use some preparation to color your marble and give a mellow tone to your sculptural works. But you will excuse me for saying that I should prefer to see the group of the graces in the genuine luster of the pure Carrera marble. Catramez claims that colored materials were used by the ancients to augment the splendor of their most prominent monuments seems to have encouraged a symbiotic relationship between critic and sculptor over the matter of color. Canova's tendency to color his marble sculptures, if not always by using tints, then at least by emphasizing contrasts of texture and surface between skin and drapery, might have encouraged Catramere to be more receptive to such possibilities in ancient sculpture. Equally, the critics' researches surely encouraged Canova to believe that such forms of coloration had the sanction of the ancients. Yet it's perhaps a sign of the lack of consistency of Catramere as a theorist, um, or his own opportunism, that he did not seek to re reconcile his platonic insistence on the ideal with his claim that the ancients had sought to imbue their works with precisely the kind of theatricality and popular appeal that he had disdained in his theoretical works as being merely narrative. The implicit distancing by Catramere of the great Greek originals into the realm of reverie brought them into a certain compatibility with the, with the idealism of Sur l'ideal, for though the later 19th century made the idea of polychrome sculpture a real possibility, Catramere emphasizes its essential unattainability to modern sculptors. There is no suggestion that Catramere encouraged Canova or other sculptors to emulate the chryselephantine Greek method, which he assumed to have been confined to the gigantic cult statues. Though he does state that decorative or architectural sculpture could have been colored even where it was made of marble or other stone. He notes that it's remarkable how many sculptures have preserved, or so he thought, a luster after so many centuries, citing rather implausibly the Antinous, Apollo Belvedere, and the Venus de' Medici as evidence that such works had been waxed originally. He identified two distinct reasons for this coating. The first was that wax was a protection from sun-altering colors, and it could save marble from the effects of humidity. And the second was that it was soothing to the eye and complemented its beauty. He claimed that wax also allows tinting if mixed with colors. These must have been light tints now badly discolored in whatever traces might remain on antique fragments. It also allows coloring without any alteration or thickening. He claimed that indications of tinting are most often found on nude figures as a reddish tone, a little like flesh color. And in Catramere's time, it was usually rubbed off antiquities by restorers or faded away uh, with exposure to light, uh, as in the case of the Egana marbles, which reportedly had traces of color still when they were brought out of the ground. Despite Canova's knowledge of Catramere's views on color and vice versa, the extent of coloring carried out by Canova remains hard to grasp. In 
The reason is the amount of emotion that surrounded the issue and the varied possibilities, uh, which in Canova's case seemed to have gone from a waxing to mitigate the stark whiteness of newly carved Carrara marble to red colouring applied to lips and cheeks, which gave a heightened sense of reality to the surface of the figures and differentiated skin from drapery uh, and, of course, to the addition of of Dorure. And why was there so much emotion attached to what seems such a transient and no longer visible effect? One answer, I think, is that it brings to the fore fundamental questions about the very nature of sculpture and its difference from painting that go back to antiquity, became pressing in the Renaissance, and I'm thinking here of Leonardo's Paragone, and are still alive today, though the terms have changed. The question of color in sculpture reflects also on the role of authority in the judgment of art. Who is to decide what is legitimate in art? Is it the patrons, like the Countess Albrizzi or the Bonaparte family, who seem to have had a direct response to the sensual character of Canova's art, or was it intellectual critics like Fernoff and Catramere who had read Kant on aesthetics and who sought a more elevated response to art? Canova, like many other artists of the period, was torn between these two viewpoints, grateful to the Bonapartes and others whose commissions enabled him to run a big studio and achieve social success, but also wanting to keep the high-minded keepers of the antique flame on his side as well. I think that we would now uh, be more on the side of the Bonapartes and admire the technical and representational brilliance of Canova uh, and, of course, Bernini. Um, but there is still the feeling expressed in this, the classical building, which we're in this very moment, and its central place in the nation's capital, that we also see art as something that has an ineffable value beyond giving pleasure to the senses. Thank you very much.